30 million dead? Jesus' brother? I've got a juicy one for you today, so let me introduce the subject of this video. And here he is, Hong Xiaochuan, Jesus' brother. Maybe. At least that's what he thought he was. He founded the Taiping movement and pretty much tried to take over China. Haven't heard of him? I'm not surprised. But let's learn about him now. Born in 1814 to a poor farming community, bear in mind pretty much all of China was a poor farming community at that time, he had aspirations to follow in his father's footsteps, who actually was a minor official. Hong Xiaotuan studied his ass off and convinced his parents to get him a tutor and send him to Guangzhou to take the government entrance exam. This exam had a pass rate of 1%, and while Xiaotuan was the smartest guy in his village, that didn't mean too much in a big city like Guangzhou. The imperial examinations were open to anyone, so people from all walks of life tried their hand at it. Whether you were a peasant or a noble, everybody was equal when it was time to take the exam. There were still inequalities since the upper classes naturally had better access to tutors and materials, but that's just the way it is, isn't it? Still pretty good to have a system based on merit for the time, though. Very progressive. Everyone in Xiaotuan's village thought he was a shoe in for the exam, since he began his education at 5 years old and by the age of 10 he could recite full books on Confucianism verbatim. Now, in regards to the tests, these ones weren't like the tests we have these days. Back then they would lock you in a little room for several days and have you write essays. If you messed up a single stroke on a character, you were done, and most people had to take them several times. Anyway, Xiaotuan failed the exam, naturally, but instead of giving up, he teams up with his friend and smashes out his study routine for an entire year. After that year, he returns to Guangzhou, fails the exam again. It's at this point where he comes into contact with some Christian missionaries in Guangzhou and gets some pamphlets on Jesus, the new guy in town. Anyway, he goes back to his hometown and goes full monk mode, studying his ass off for another long period of time. He goes back to Guangzhou, fails the test again leading him to a complete nervous breakdown and questioning of life choices. While under the immense stress, he had a vision in which Confucian sages along with Jesus come to him to tell him to rid China of all demons, revealing his grand destiny in life. At the time he didn't really take too much attention of the dream and kind of put it at the back of his mind, but later on it would uh, come back to be somewhat relevant. Six years later he takes the exam again, and Lo and behold, he fails it. Again. And this is where he really loses it, and takes the path of insane cult leader instead of government administrator. He gets out the old pamphlets he got in Guangzhou, and after some pretty hard mental gymnastics, makes the bold claim that he is actually Jesus' brother, and he's beginning his destiny to rid the entire country of demons. He then begins to smash up the entire house, destroying all of the Buddhist icons within and destroying all of the Buddhist scriptures and books that they had. A lot of his other buddies in the village were also failing the exams and didn't really like the ideas of being farmers, so they thought, why not go on a big adventure around China? So from there, Xiuquan and his buddies started to roam the countryside, smashing up people's homes and spreading the good word. Obviously getting very popular along the way. Now after a while of this debauchery, Xiuquan gets a little tired and goes home. His cousin Feng Yunshan keeps proselytizing around the country. Later on, he goes to visit Yunshan and discovers that he's amassed a group of a few thousand peasants following him, who he is convinced that he is their king. Xiuquan thinks this is awesome and decides to stick around for the party. Now it's at this point where Xiuquan decides to get the razor tool out and start rewriting the Bible to serve his own interest. He decides to cut out any references to alcohol and strips the Old Testament down of the stuff he doesn't like. They ended up banning opium, alcohol, polygamy, and tons of other fun stuff. Now they also banned foot binding, which was a pretty welcome change, but bear in mind it was not in the practice of the Hakka people, of which Hong Xiaotuan was one of this ethnic minority, to do foot binding, so often in southern parts of Guangdong where you would find Hakka people, the women would be out in the fields working with the men just the same. Now the Qing Emperor had started to take notice of all of this and called in the army, and Xiuquan managed to actually defeat them. This gave the Taiping movement more confidence and momentum, so they started just taking over whatever cities they could get their hands on and gaining followers along the way. They were taking massive casualties, but the peasantry were so dissatisfied with the government that they were willing to take a chance on something new. 
And at this time, the Taiping rebels were fairly well armed as well. They managed to buy munitions from English and American manufacturers, and by 1853 they were armed to the teeth. They even had cannons. Western observers noted that the locally manufactured weapons that the Taiping started making were actually better than those of the Qing government. Many of the Qing government weapons were horribly outdated, and they bought them off the British who had used them in previous wars. Some of these foreigners actually joined up with the Taiping, mainly in administration roles. Unfortunately, we don't have any records of foreigners fighting alongside them. The Taiping were absolutely brutal in the way they dealt with the Manchus, the ruling people of the Qing. In every area they were, they exterminated entire Manchu populations with no exceptions. But don't worry, the Manchu will get their own back later on, we'll get to that. Now this is where the movement began to expand even more. They ended up having around 2 million people in the ranks and occupied several pretty important cities. They even eventually took Nanjing, which had a scary garrison of 30,000 soldiers. But this didn't bother Xiuquan too much because he managed to bring half a million guys with him. In fact, at the peak of the movement, he had amassed an estimated 30 million followers. Unfortunately, it all had to come to a downfall eventually. All good things must come to an end. After they took Nanjing, Xiao Chuan began to take the route all cult leaders seemed to take and gave himself over to excess and luxury. He spent all day in his nice comfortable little palace at Nanjing with his new advisors, and people were starting to take notice. The upper classes began to withdraw their support for the Taiping due to the strict rules about gender segregation, and some of the peasantry even began to feel like the new government was no different to the old one or at least became like the Qing government that they despised so much in the past. It was also at this time where some of his generals and close advisors were beginning to lose patience with Xiao Chuan. Now this got Xiao Chuan a little bit angry and he began to lose patience with them as well. He did not like the questions. Anyway, this all culminated in the Tianjin incident in the purge of over 27,000 political rivals. Now while all this was going on, the Qing government were really getting serious about taking back the territory they'd lost. So they gathered all of their armies together and now they were being supported by some French and British troops as well. And they ended up going further south to take back the smaller cities from the Taiping Rebellion. And at this time they were closing in on Nanjing as well. Xiu Zhuan was getting pretty nervous. The writing was on the wall for him at this point, but he stuck to his guns and claimed that the big daddy upstairs would help them defend Nanjing. Unfortunately for Xiao Chuan, Dad did not come through. And instead of having a heroic end in battle, some poetic end to the story, he died of food poisoning because he ate a bunch of weeds from the garden. Three days later, Nanjing was captured, and the Qing began sweeping up any pockets of Taiping rebels left over, most of which seemed to disappear back into the peasant ranks. In fact, only around 10% of the Taiping rebels survived this whole incident. The Qing government and Qing army took a zero tolerance policy to anyone they suspected of being in the movement, or used to being in the movement, and launched waves of massacres all over southern China. Some saying that the death toll was around 30,000 per day. So little by little, the Taiping rebellion faded into the annals of history. But it certainly makes for an interesting story when we look back and one that I'm not sure why we didn't learn about in school. Maybe Chinese history is not as important in Western schools, but I think it's definitely a page of history that's worth talking about. If you want to know more about history and have a bit of a laugh, have a good time together, then you're probably best to subscribe to the channel. Give the page a like and share it with one of your friends too. It's perfect to watch these videos while you're having dinner, lunch, breakfast, that's what I do. Anyway, I will see you next time. Thank you for joining us and have a good day.